I mean, we were brainwashed, basically. And when someone would bring up the term cult, we were just like, oh, this isn't a cult. Like, we're, we're choosing to do this. We're choosing to be here. I completely believed it. I thought I would be a plural life. I, I just thought that that was my destiny. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. Welcome, welcome! So, real quick, if you are listening only and you would prefer to watch this, head over to my YouTube channel, Cults to Consciousness, where you can see the whole thing. So I'm very excited today to be joined by a guest, uh, a new friend. Um, I'm so glad she just slipped into my DMs and was like, hey, I have a story to tell. And I was like, yes, I'm here for it. So I am joined today by Angela. Welcome, Angela. Yay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So you really have been through the full gambit. Um, I grew up as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but in what we call like the mainstream Mormonism. Right. And so I'm really excited to hear from your perspective going from the fundamentalist Mormonism and then saying, okay, that's a little too much, but then still landing on the mainstream Mormonism and then saying, actually, this is still way too much and then (laughs) booking it out of there and we can talk about how you are where you are today. So let's start at the beginning. You said your parents were converts when you were five. Did they ever tell you like how this came to be or um, were they just doing some deep dives into the doctrine and realized, oh wow, mainstream Mormons are doing this all wrong, which they kind of are according to like the original teachings, right? (laughs) So there is so many conflicts. Yeah, like you said, like there's conflicts between um, the doctrine because there's all this doctrine that, you know, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and the early prophets brought forth, and then everything changed. And, like, the fundamentalists want to stick to the fundamentals of any religion and um, be more extreme with it. So my parents wanted more of that part, which my mom's family was already really into the polygamy side of things because my great-grandpa like was a polygamist and then also my grandpa was a polygamist oh. but they weren't in any set group um and so my dad kind of just fell into this family of polygamists I guess when he married my mom but okay so so your mom was already part of the a polygamist group she was she was in the mainstream church but she believed in like more fundamental principles okay um so they were married in the temple but when like the black revelation happened in 1978 they were like no way this is way too much we can't allow this you know type of things to be taught to our children wow. and so they pulled us out of the church and started looking for uh fundamentalists yes my parents are so racist it's insane <laughs> wait so okay <laughs> So your parents, you just said your parents were racist, racist. So they were against Very allowing, racist, yes. they were against allowing black people to join yes. the church. They were like, whoa, it's, the, this is out of control. <laughs> yes. Wow. That was the divining wow. factor of why they pulled us kids, you know, out of the church and started, you know, initially just having like church sessions at home. And then we you know, joined this, it's called the Apostolic United Brethren, which they call it the AUB, um, when I was about five years old. And, you know, they're very stick to the fundamentals. And one of the things that they highly believe is that the Blacks can't have the priesthood. You know, Brigham Young taught that the Blacks were a lesser people in the preexistence. They weren't as um, pure and stalwart. And so, they followed that teaching of Brigham Young. Wow. That was the defining factor for my family. Yeah, if I had grown up and married a black man, I would have been completely shunned and cut off from my family completely. Just wow. They believe that it's a cursed race. As a matter of fact, it's kind of a tangent on it, but my sister <clears throat> that is a polygamist, you know, she's a plural wife. She 
when she was getting having her babies, they wanted to give her the Rogam shot because her blood type is negative and her husband's is positive, but she refused to take the Rogam shot because she was worried that she might get a black person's blood and have, you know, the cursed. No. So she refused to take the Rogam shot because of that. Wow. Okay. So this these are family members who currently think this way. This isn't like a past Yes. Version. Yes, I have oh. half of my family has stayed in this polygamous group. I have uh, three siblings that are active in the LDS church. And then me and one of my siblings, my brother, are completely um, left the church. And so it's kind of like helter- we're, there's 10 of us all together of my siblings. So. Okay, I was that was my next question. I was like, okay, how, wait, how many? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. I'm all over the place. With no, my that's are. okay. That's okay. Okay. So let's go back a little bit. So your parents, um, they're like, okay, the mainstream Mormons are not doing it right, which we already established is true based on the original doctrine of Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, the early prophets. Yeah. And so they join this yes. new sect of fundamentalist Mormons. They start with um home churching i guess we could call it instead of homeschooling <laughs> yes and homeschooling yeah we were homeschooled oh, too <laughs> okay were you always homeschooled or just in this moment when they decided to split so i went to public school so i grew up in salt lake and then we moved out to fairview and i went to public school just through elementary school which i feel like helped because homeschool is such a hard thing for kids to learn how to interact with each other mm-hmm. and like you know the basic things of social interactions is important. And um, so I'm grateful that I at least had some schooling through, you know, in the public school system. But Okay. So you start getting homeschooled. What was that change like for you? Did you feel like, I mean, I know you were so young, so it's probably hard to kind of comprehend what's going on. But at that age, did you realize that something was off or like, oh, wow, mom and dad are really changing our lifestyle. I'm not okay with this. I mean, Growing up in it, it was just completely normal. Like that was what I believed. I went with it and I felt like, and we were taught not to talk to anyone about a religion. If someone asked us what our religion was, we were told, you know, just tell them Christian and keep everything a secret. Interesting. Um, Which um, we were a little bit away from most of the people in this group because they have like set communities. There's one in Bluffdale and one uh, right by Mona against you know by the freeway there I never lived in their communities but we would drive an hour and a half two hours to go to church every Sunday and we went to all of their functions and yeah but I never lived in the community which I'm very grateful for too because I feel like that that helped me be a little bit more open-minded I find it really interesting that that your parents didn't want you to talk about your religion outside of you know, your your bubble, because it was such the opposite for me growing up in the, the mainstream Mormonism is like, tell everyone, proselytize, convert your friends and your neighbors, <laughs> tell everyone about the gospel. So that's so interesting. Do you think it's because they wanted to avoid um, public attention, maybe because polygamy was going on and that's illegal? Or why do you think that was? That's a big part of it. Um I don't know. Are you familiar at all with like the singer swaps incident that happened like in the eighties? I don't know. It's this whole story where my family was best friends with this um, fundamentalist before they joined this church. And there was this whole, I know this is like such a tangent, but no, that's okay. Please. (laughs) They blew up an LDS church. These people did. And they ended up having this whole like shootout and standoff and had kids taken away and people ended up in prison. And these were my family's like best friends. And so they had this mindset of, you know, everyone's out to get you because I think of these incidents that happened to their friends. And so, you know, obviously because polygamy is illegal and then also that um, incident that had happened. Did that um, anxiety trickle down into your thoughts and beliefs were you a little paranoid that something was going to go down or were you just totally oblivious to everything and like cool this is our life Mm -hmm. there's definitely a part I feel like I grew up to be ashamed of who I was in a way because you know like 
growing up in a small town in Utah, everyone is LDS. Right. And when you're told you can't tell anyone, not only was I worried about, you know, the law side of, you know, polygamy and, you know, that, but also like what people would think because, you know, you're looked at like you're weird and strange and, you know, like that, especially in a small community like that, like I, cause I grew up in Fairview, like I said. Um, and so there was definitely this shame factor where I felt like it was like a bad thing. Like people were going to look down on you, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. When my family first moved to Fairview, my dad was building this house and he this is kind of an interesting side story, but um, we lived there with no electricity, no running water, um, no propane or anything. We pretty much lived like that for almost four years. My poor mom Whoa. had 10 kids in this house with no running water and no electricity. What? Um, From the time I was about five till nine. So I remember like washing our clothes in the bathtub hauling the water, like cooking things on the camp stove and kerosene lanterns. Like it's kind of a definitely different way to grow up in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So between five to 10, you're living this way. Two questions. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. My first question is, was this part of a fundamentalist belief or is it just something that was like a coincidence and it just happened? And then my second question would be, were you still interacting with friends outside of this fundamentalist sect? So did you notice how different your family was or were you completely cut off and you just thought this is how life was? Well, I knew I was different or we were different um, because I, like I said, I went to public school through elementary school and I had one birthday party at my house and, you know, I invited my schoolmates to my house and they were just stunned by the way that our house was like, you know, we had no TV, no electricity. And, you know, so everyone at the school was talking about it. And oh. like, I struggled making friends anyways. And so I kind of obviously stopped inviting people over to my house because I, you know, I was ashamed, like I said, as far as like the belief for your first question, it not necessarily a belief that polygamists have to live that way. I think my parents are just crazy. <laughs> like that's pretty much the only thing I can come up with is that one. Um, they wanted to do everything without any debt. And so my dad was just building the house slowly and just doing one tiny little thing at a time. And it just ended up taking four years for that stuff to happen. Right. Okay. So I was initially thinking that you were living normally and then they wanted to join this um, fundamentalist group. And that's when you moved into the house with no electricity. But this was happening before the switch. We joined the group when I was still living in Salt Lake. Okay. So we had joined the group and then we moved and lived like pioneers. <laughs> but yeah, so, but it, it was more coincidental. It wasn't because of the group that we lived like that. Got it. Okay. So, all right. So now maybe we can jump ahead to like your teen years and you have electricity now, right? You said you got electricity yes. around 10. So you're kind of starting to fit back into normal society in a way. And, but you're still being taught these fundamentalist principles. So how did that affect your adolescence? Like as far as dating goes or as far as, trying to become um, like a, a homemaker, right? Which is, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is like the main point of being a woman is you have to learn how to be a homemaker and raise all of the kids. Yes, that was a big like push for us. In fact, I always wanted to become a nurse like my mom. So I wanted to go to college. And my, I felt some like discouragement to do that because it, the push is so big on you need to just, plan on being a mom and being staying at home taking care of your kids but I I was home through school through high school and my mindset at that point in time was I had a testimony that this was true and I I honestly didn't question it whatsoever like I like it's this mindset where you think that 
you have the ultimate truth and everyone else is wrong. Which yeah. looking back at that now, I'm like, it was so narrow minded and just, I mean, we were brainwashed basically. Um, and when someone would bring up the term cult, we were just like, oh, this isn't a cult. Like we're, we're choosing to do this. We're choosing to be here and this is our choice, but it's like, at what cost? You're told that you're not going to go to heaven. You're not going to gain your exaltation or have any sort of afterlife. It's almost the concept is almost like you have to sacrifice yourself in this life, you know, all your wants and needs in order to gain an exaltation in the next life. You know, it's a, it's a huge manipulation if you think about it, the way that you're taught. And I went along with it. I completely believed it. I thought I would be a plural life. I, I just thought that that was my destiny. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I was in college, <clears throat> which I was about 19, 20 years old, when I started getting a little bit confused. Um, I had this kid that was a return missionary that found out that I wasn't, you know, a member of the LDS church. And he wanted me to take the missionary discussions, which I thought I would be able to convince him of my way of thinking because <laughs> I knew I was right. Like, of course. There's no, and there's so much inconsistencies with the church history and their doctrine that you can point it out and show like, this doesn't make any sense. Like it's, it's very blatant, you know, the, the difference in the doctrines and stuff. After lots of missionary discussions, I finally got to a point of, instead of just knowing that I had the truth, I got to a point where I was confused. And I wasn't used to that. It was a scary place to be because I, I'd never been confused. And looking back, I've realized that being confused is one of the best mindsets you could ever have because it means you're not being closed-minded. You're open. You're open yeah. to the what ifs. And instead of just being set in your, and, and now looking back, I feel like almost on everything, instead of feeling like, oh, I know the answer to this. It's like, well, I don't know. Like, and I'm open-minded about it. And there's different perspectives and there's not necessarily one right and one wrong. Like, and I didn't get that then, but um, when I was 20, I ended up joining the LDS church. Um, that was one of the hardest things I ever did because I was such a letdown to my family oh. because, you know, they had this hope for me that I would become, you know, this saint in their religion type of a thing, you know, and I, I let them down and it was really hard for me to talk to them about it. And, and to be honest with them, the day that I told them that I was joining the church, my little sister cried all night long. Mm. And when I kept trying to console her, she told me, how would you be feel if I became a prostitute? That's how you're making <gasps> me feel right now. <laughs> you know, she compared that Whoa. me joining the church to like, but she was young and immature. Oh my gosh. So there's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> Um, Sorry, I just keep talking. <laughs> no, I love it. And I, I, I want you to keep going. I'm just going to ask, I'm going to interject a few questions here and there. So, okay, she just... She just said that you're like a prostitute by joining a less strict. Yes, if I, if she had become a prostitute, because that's how she, I made her feel. Like that's in her mind, like you're as extreme as a prostitute, which we need to also realize the context. Like to her, a prostitute is probably the worst sinner in the world, right? The worst thing that you could ever do, yeah. I feel like if I were to have a, a debate with um, a mainstream Mormon as a fundamentalist, I feel like I would win the conversation because <laughs> I could point to the scriptures and be like, no, see, it says right here that you have to be polygamous in order to get to heaven. Or yeah. no, see, like Brigham Young taught blood atonement, like crazy stuff that to any normal human would be like. Yes. And I, I pointed all of that stuff out to my friend too. Like there's, there's so much evidence that the church just keeps changing doctrine and but he had points for me too that all of a sudden I realized that there wasn't there was inconsistencies in both religions, you know what I mean? And I did feel like it was the right thing, you know, I prayed and I followed just my intuition finally for the first time in my life and I joined the church. 
Yeah, I was just wondering how you went from the more extreme version and realized that the less extreme version, the one that had been changed multiple times, was actually the correct version and like how you made sense of that in your head and and maybe like how you had that conversation with your family of like, no, you guys are doing it wrong and this is the right way. I almost had to like dumb it down and like instead of looking at it like like all of these like truths, I finally got to a point where I realized like like these higher doctrines as they call them, they really didn't matter because these people weren't living Christ's teachings. Like the simple, like don't judge people and love one another. Like the basic cores of what Mormonism is supposed to be about was not being followed whatsoever in this polygamous group. Like right. it was very, um, like I never felt like I fit in there. It was very cliquish. Um, and so a lot of it was just feeling like, they're both wrong. Like I looked at it and I, I, that's the, I, how should I say this? I, kn- I knew that the church still had a lot of things that I could not make sense of, but I decided to join it anyways, because I still felt like Joseph Smith was a prophet. I still mm. believed in the book of Mormon. And I felt like I was being guided in that direction. Like that was what God wanted me to do. But I never reached a point where I could, that I was saying, Oh, you know, this man is a prophet, like Gordon B. Hinckley at the time, you know, I, I couldn't sit there and bear my testimony that he was a prophet because I was still confused. And I never reached the point in the church that I felt like I knew that that was the only truth either. I just felt like it was the right thing for me to do at the time. Also, it probably felt like the easier transition with your family rather than just saying I'm not Mormon at all which would be super extreme so do you think maybe subconsciously that was a reason why you're like no 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 I'm still Mormon I'm just not as Mormon as you um no I I still believed in Mormonism okay like I still like I said like I still believed in Joseph Smith like I wasn't completely I didn't feel like I was turning my back on Mormonism in general I just didn't feel like my path was in the polygamous group, even though there was still a part of me that still believed the doctrine that they taught because it was like the fundamentalist, you know, it was. And so it's almost like I left feeling like it was still true, but I felt like it was what I had to do with my life. It wasn't until I ate mushrooms like years down the road. Yes, that I finally like realized what a bunch of bullcrap all of it is. <laughs> what a manipulation. And like, it, it took me a long time to reach that point. Like, um, let's see, I'm 38 now. So when I was about 35, so 15 years later. Wow. And I also wanted to touch on, I don't think we ever brought this part up so was your dad married to other women besides your mom my dad did not marry other women until my mom passed away and now he has another wife but my I have three sisters that are in polygamous situations um but my dad is kind of a difficult person and he never really could find another woman that wanted to marry him <laughs> besides my mom what's her soul <laughs> So, I know that that's <laughs> wait so he's you like that, he's like no no no. I wanted more wives but no one would have me <laughs> yes he dated women like he would try and find other wives and the process for dating in the polygamous group is pretty intense like in order to date a woman you have to talk to your bishop first and discuss it with him and make sure that your priesthood leader is okay and then you talk to the girl's father you know you can't just walk up and talk to a girl and after the father gives consent, then the father then talks to the daughter and she decides whether or not she will date someone or court them. But so it's quite a process. And my dad just, yeah, he, he tried several different times, but it just never happened. So, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. That's like, that's really lucky funny. for us. <laughs> Yeah, because I I could only imagine how that would have been like for 
someone like you, someone one of 10 children, and then now you have other siblings. Did your sisters ever confide in you about how they felt about polygamy? Do you feel like they they are 100% on board or do you think they feel coerced into it? Have they talked to you about that at all? So like us saying, there's this sense of privacy. You don't complain about your life. You don't complain about your problems to anybody, um, especially me, because now I'm an outsider, you know, and so, and they view me still as an apostate. Mm. Um, I've turned my back on their religion. And so I would not be someone that they would confine in. Um, I've, I still talk to my siblings and we still do things together. I'm actually pretty close with them, but it's, we don't talk about religion. Um, as far as like where they're at, I do feel like I am so grateful that I was able to get out because I look at their lives and they do seem like they're just sacrificing themselves in order for this, you know, eternal glory. And, you know, it's like, I've realized it doesn't work that way. Like God, God would not want you to be miserable in order to get a reward. That's just like this huge manipulation that is not at all godly, but um, they, they're pretty quiet about it. Um, I feel like their husbands, like the patriarchy type mindset, you know, it's it's like their husbands are something that they revere, they have to look up to. And then when they talk to them, it's almost like they're talking down to them. Um, like they're one of the kids that they have to obey their husbands the way that they are with them. And obviously it's hard for me to watch that, but. Well, that is also a, a principle of Mormonism is you have to swear fealty to your husband and your husband swears fealty to God. Yes. And I know they recently changed that in the language in the temple, but that's still a thing. So it would make sense right. as to why they felt justified to essentially rule over their wife or wives in that situation. Right. They have the priesthood and they're, they're, they're the ship. So. Yeah. My grandma married, her husband had several wives, like three wives, and they didn't start polygamy until my grandma was about 40. Oh, and wow. that was a very hard thing for her because she all of a sudden had to share her husband, that she, that's just the two of them. And then after 40 years, or I guess 20 years of marriage, she had to start sharing him and it was very difficult for her. And it's funny because my mom was always so judgmental towards her for the fact that she had a hard time with that, but my mom never had to deal with the same issues. Right. So. Wow. Did you ever interact with any of your grandma's sister wives? Yes. Um, I remember when I was younger, we would go visit, um, the one sister wife and her kids because all of her kids were the same age as, as us kids. So I have like seven aunts and uncles that are like all of our kids, same age. Um, so we would have sleepovers and stuff when I was little. And then her other sister wife is actually my mom's aunt. So he, my grandpa married my grandma's younger sister. Wait, say that again. My grandpa married my grandma's younger sister as well. So he married sisters. No. Yeah. No. That happens a lot, actually, in, in the polygamous groups. Yeah. Can you imagine sharing your man with your sister? <laughs> like, um, no. It's <laughs> unreal. I can't imagine sharing my man with anyone. Um, And so you grew up around this lifestyle, around polygamy, and you were uh, clearly inserted into this lifestyle. So I'm curious, as before you were 20, before you were like, no, I'm going to join the mainstream Mormons, um... Were you planning on being a polygamous wife or from the beginning were you like, that is not for me? I always planned on it. I always like thought that that and like it just it seemed normal to me at the time. Like it seemed like that's just what you do in order to get from A to B. You have to do these things, you know, like it's it was just that was almost like a common sense thing that that was something that I was going to do in my life. And I didn't question it whatsoever until I started getting confused so yeah, yeah. I, I completely like I would stand up in church and bear my testimony like I was completely 
I believed it. And it makes sense when you are raised in something like that. You don't really question it until someone asks you a question and then you're like, hmm, let me think about that. <laughs> well, and you're you're taught this mindset of, you know, the in the church too, you know, the iron rod. You you don't look to the left and you don't look to the right. You just focus on the word of God and like, you know, follow the prophet. And, you know, you're taught not to seek for answers for yourself. You're taught to just follow the prophet. And I, I remember doing this exercise when I was in a youth conference where they blindfolded us and we held onto this rope. And the mindset was, you know, the prophet's going to guide you and you just have to have the faith to, you know, you don't know where you're going, but you just follow. So like they're leading us all over this rocky hill and all, you know, we're falling down and the, you know, the lesson was to just have faith in the prophet. And it's like, you think about it and you're taught not to follow your intuition, not to question anything. You know, it's, it's just, like I said, it's brainwashing and manipulation, but. Yeah. And not only that, not only is it literally blind obedience, but just the imagery yes. of you trying to climb a mountain blindfolded and you're tripping and you're probably scraping your knees and your hands probably hurt from the rope because you're gripping so tight and getting rope burn. And it's like, be in pain and suffering for God. And it's yes. just wild yes. to me that that they can drill that into your brain so hard that you don't realize the suffering is for nothing or you don't realize that you don't have to suffer it in general and right. so I would love right. to transition into this part where you take mushrooms and then you're like oh all I have to do is let go of this rod this rope this pain yeah. this suffering and what that felt like for you and if you want to go into your trip details we love those <laughs> for sure so there's like a chunk of time that happened between the time I was like 21 until I was 35. I actually, um, so I was in the church when I was 21 and I was active and do, doing my best at the time. And I, at one point in time, I just have a quick story of like my yeah. encounters with the church. I wasn't active in the church for just the first like year, I think is the only time I was actually active mm. in the church. So I, but I still believed that. I just felt like I was not good enough to, I'll, I'll finish my story. But so basically when I was 21, I was going to nursing school and I was working and I was trying to, you know, pay my tithing and do all of the things that I was supposed to do. And I, at one point in time, I would go to church to sacrament meeting and then I would go to Sunday school and then hurry and run home and get ready for work because I was a nurse's assistant at a nursing home and my Relief Society president, because I was missing Relief Society, she pulled me aside and she told me like, hey, like we've been missing you at Relief Society. And I told her, oh, yes, I, I haven't been able to go because I'm working. And so I've been able to make it to my other meetings, though. And she told me that I needed to pray about it and quit my job because it was more important that I go make it to my Relief Society meetings than go to work because we're not supposed to work on Sunday, you know. I've had and that exact same I experience. I looked at her <laughs> and I was like, what, who, who would take care of elderly people in a nursing home if we all don't work on Sundays? Like, how do you rectify that? Anyways, so there was just little things that had happened. And then I actually started dating this guy and I ended up having premarital sex, which. Uh-oh. I know I, there was so much guilt and shame and like I felt like I was going to hell and you know especially growing up in the, the purity culture in the polygamous group is even more intense than the church you know you don't even kiss or like hold hands before marriage almost like it's, really it's pretty intense yeah they're even worse than like a, I don't know but so I ended up you know, having this huge, like shame that was on me. And I was dating this man. And I decided, even though like at the time, I pray about it. And my intuition kept telling me, he's not right for you. Like you, you need to like move on. But I told myself, like, you've already had sex with him. So you've already 
like there, you don't have any other choice but to get married, mm. which is so ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was where my my mind was at 21. Like I really was just so consumed by guilt and shame that I let those negative emotions guide the most important decisions of my life. Yeah. And so I ended up getting married and um, before I got married, my state president, who was also like my institute teacher, he kept telling me, Hey, I want, you need to come in and ha have a state president interview because I had asked to use the ward house to have our reception. Mm -hmm. And I kept trying to like avoid it because I was like, you know, here I am having sex and not wanting to talk to my state president. And, you know, I wasn't wanting to communicate with anybody about that. I wasn't wanting to like, I just wanted to deal with it on my own. And he kept, you know, being persistent about it. <clears throat> so I ended up going into his office and he, like, he looked at me in the eyes and he said, are you, have you been following the law of chastity. Like that was the whole reason he called me in there was to talk about it. And I just, I was so upset and I felt so, um, like I felt like he just wanted to you know, know my personal intimate, you know, like yeah. it's this horny old man. Like, yeah. I, like I, the way that he was asking me about it, it's like he's wanting details about this. And I just lied to him and I told him no. Nope, wow. I have no problems with that. Like, I just completely lied to him because I did not want to, like, have that conversation with him. And he, he made me feel very uncomfortable. But that's actually, I have to interject because that's incredibly brave of you to lie. Because especially when you were describing how you felt after you had sex for the first time and you weren't married, I know those feelings of the extreme guilt and shame and unworthiness. And so when you do have this, what they call worthiness interview, and you're able to stand your ground and be like, no, I don't want to talk about my sex life with you alone in a room, that takes a lot of guts to do that. Well, and I think for, in my mindset, like I wasn't trying to go to the temple. I wasn't mm. asking to have a worthiness interview. Like he sought me out and like made me talk about it. Like it wasn't any sort right. of, if I had been trying to go to the temple, I could see, you know, obviously I don't, I wouldn't have lied about that mm. because the amount of shame I would have felt from that would have been so intense. But I just, the culture of these men bringing in these young women and wanting to talk about their sex life. It's just, it's so disturbing. And like you hear about these stories and it's, it's sad that it's continuing. I feel like there's been a little bit of light brought to it, but mm -hmm. So I ended up staying married to this guy that was an alcoholic and mm. just very abusive for 10 years. Um, wow. Which I stayed with him still because of guilt. Like I let guilt be my defining emotion that made my decisions. I felt too guilty to leave him. I was basically his caretaker because he had uh, medical problems. But um, I had my son. And I was finally able to leave my husband for my son because I realized that he was being affected negatively by this just awful marriage. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to get out. And then this is when I started finding my, like who I was as a person and being more self-aware was when I left my husband, I was about 33 years old. I, at the time I was so lost. Like I had gained over a hundred pounds. I had no self-worth at all. Like I just thought that I was completely worthless. You know, growing up in that community where your value as a woman is completely on how you are as a wife, as a mother, and you, you're not taught to ever put yourself first. And I, I finally like stepped up and realized I needed to make a change. I honestly, like I started eating healthy, I started exercising and started like just researching different things that I hadn't before, more spirituality type stuff. And I started dating this my now husband. Um and he introduced me to mushrooms. Yay! Um, yay, I know. I didn't expect them to change my life. Like I yeah. it was a lot to even get me to take them because I was like, no, drugs are bad. That's 
like we don't do that Mm -hmm. and it took him a long time to like talk me into it and I remember my first trip when it kicked in and that body euphoria started hitting I remember thinking oh I get it this is why people do drugs (laughs) yeah okay I just I have to (laughs) I have to quickly point out because Um, For our listeners, if you've never grown up in a high demand religion or cult or something similar to what we're talking about, it's really hard to understand how deep the programming goes. So we're speaking here about how how Angela um, left the ideology of the church behind, but was still so rooted in the programming that she allowed herself to be in a a 10 year marriage an abusive 10 year marriage. So I have to always like nail that in when I'm talking to people because they're like, Oh, just leave the church. It's like, you can't just leave and leave with everything intact. And like, Oh, now I'm a normal functioning human of society. It takes a lot of deprogramming and it takes a lot of time to finally wake up and become conscious to what's going on. And sometimes it takes completely removing yourself from an environment. Sometimes it takes mushrooms. Sometimes it takes a really supportive person like your now husband to be like, hey, I got you. I can help you. And it's not an easy thing. So I just had to lay that groundwork there because some people just don't understand. And and yeah, okay. So we took mushrooms. Here we go. Yeah, my self-esteem, like I'd always felt like I was worthless. So yeah, like that to me, it was the biggest, like, I had never felt like I was loved by God or, you know, like, the, there was never, like, that connection where, and it's not something that you can just tell someone, like, oh, go find self-love, because you, right. you hear that, like, oh, work on self-love, but that's something that, it's very difficult to find if you don't have it. Mm. But anyways, so my first trip, I, like, had all of these emotions that were coming up, which I hadn't expected. I thought it was just going to be fun. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, this is just a good time. Like I didn't expect like, like fixing my brain. Right. So I was able to let go of all this negative emotions that I had towards my ex-husband. And um, I really felt like this connection to, I guess you would call it the universe. Um, in my mind, the universe consciousness god it's all the same thing you know so some people don't like the term god but it's just it's like that higher power Mm -hmm. anyways i felt a connection to it that i had never felt before and it was just completely eye-opening and awakening to me um there was so the last couple of years there's been other um, trips that have like really helped me with my healing journey. Um, so my mom passed away, uh, th- about three years ago, uh, pulmonary fibrosis. And I always had this, you know, where I never felt like I could be honest with her about my life. I never felt like I could really, because, you know, she was so judgmental and my, my mom was a complete angel, like probably like you picture like a Mormon pioneer and that would be what my mom is like, just one of the most awesome people in the world, but very set in her ways and her mindset and very narrow minded in her thinking. Anyways. um, So she passed away and I never felt like I had the relationship with her that I had wanted. And like, cause at the time I was living with my boyfriend and, you know, I couldn't talk to her about that. You know, I couldn't, be open with her about you know the biggest parts of my life mm-hmm. because you know she would have <laughs> freaked out but I had this mushroom trip where I I was completely coherent and with it and all of a sudden I realized that my mom was next to me mm. and I just started bawling it's like I could see her like in a window. I don't know. It's not like I could see her with my eyes. It's just like I felt eye. her presence there. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I, she was just telling me how much she loved me and how proud of me she was and how she felt bad that she was so narrow minded and didn't, you know, see me for who I was. Mm. And it, like just this beautiful healing um 
conversation that I had with her. And if I hadn't have been for the mushrooms, like I would not have had that, the type of healing that I needed, which I mean, people could say, okay, you're on mushrooms, you're hallucinating, but it felt real to me in the way that I was able to like let go of a lot of, you know, hurt feelings and stuff. Yeah. That's one of the major things that I love about psychedelics is it just removes the ego enough to where you can have active imagination, to where you can access deeper parts of your psyche, you can make new connections in your brain, you can remember instances that may have affected you and created core memories, which in turn created program beliefs that now you can purge and get rid of. And like you said, it doesn't matter what the quote reality is, what matters is how it changes you in a positive way. Right. So I feel like at this point, I I ended up having my brother eat him with me. And he went from, because, you know, he had left this group as well and had a lot of baggage with that. And he, he ate mushrooms with me. And he went from being a complete atheist and not believing in anything to believing in this you know, this consciousness and this God, he had this tremendous experience as well. Um, My husband, his life is completely changed because of it, which I mean, as a disclaimer, I don't feel like it's going to do the same thing for everybody. There's not any part of me that thinks that everybody should just go out and do a bunch of psychedelics. (laughs) You know, each person needs to research it. And I mean, I think that set and setting is the biggest thing with it because you can have a terrible experience if you're not in the right mindset in the right setting. I agree. After those experiences, I've really, it's funny. I remember you talking about watching Gaia Mm -hmm. and watching like the psychedelic series or whatever it's called. I ended up getting that Gaia app and watching so much of the spiritual stuff. And I've really gone down the rabbit hole of the Ram Dass Ah, and yeah. all of his, I love Ram Dass. <laughs> I listen to him every single day. Like I love his mindset on um, this life. And like that alone has helped me just come to a place where I feel like I'm completely happy. And it's like I have, I feel like before all of this, it's like I was viewing my life. It's like if you don't have glasses on and everything's just out of focus. And it's just blurry. Mm -hmm. And it's like this, these experiences have put a lens over or a filter and all of a sudden everything's coming into focus. And so it's just, it's been beautiful. Oh, that's so amazing. You're happy and you're healthy and you're thriving. And where, where have you landed as far as like your day to day, as far as how you view spirituality? I know you said that you do believe in this higher power and and maybe that has shifted from a perspective of God, which I like to call like the Christian God, man on a throne type of situation to a more right. inclusive, loving, unconditional love type of energy. So where have you landed and how has that impacted your daily life and how you view the world? This last couple of years have been um, a little bit of a challenge. Like I've told you, I'm a nurse. And I, you know, we've gone through this COVID pandemic and all, you know, watching these people die and everything that's happened with politics. And it's just been, you know, a rough couple of years. And I had one of my coworkers ask me, she asked me, like, how have you dealt with this? You seem to just be so okay. Like, like all of us, you know, the nursing staff have really like just gotten jaded and not want to go to work anymore because it's been so difficult to come to work and see people dying. It's gotten a lot better right now. It's not anything where it was. And I just told her, like, I feel like this path with spirituality, it's like I can see how things are interconnected. And instead of being like closing my heart down, I've been able to open my heart up. And I feel like that has just completely changed my mindset. And allowed me to be a better wife, a mother, a nurse. And, you know, I, I I do feel like that this is just a complete 360 for me as far as my mindset goes. And 
That's really beautiful. So what what I'm hearing is not only did you go from two cults to consciousness, but you found yes. this place of I can live my life in a state of love instead of a state of fear and being closed off and kind of tunnel visioned. And now you have these glasses where everything is clear and your heart is open. You understand the world a little bit better. And not only that, but you see it from this place of expansion and love and acceptance, which is so beautiful. Yes. I love that so much. Is there anything else you would like to add about your story or anything? Oh, and before we end, we have to do our Linda Listen moment for our listeners. Do you Linda have a Linda Listen moment? Yeah. Do you have a, a Linda Listen statement? One of the things that maybe I wanted to touch on too is um, the victim mentality a little bit. Mm. I feel like as people leave these religions and you go through this this where you realize that you are this huge victim of your circumstances of what has happened to you. Um, you know, with me being a, in an abusive marriage for 10 years through, you know, these cults that I dealt with. And I feel like one of the biggest mindset change is letting go of that victim mentality and realizing that I am in control of my life. Like I am the author of my story. And yes, there's been bad negative things that have happened to me, but I don't need to let it define me as a person. Um, I feel like there's a lot of people that just hold on to that anger and it's not necessarily healthy. I understand it, but it's not a healthy way to, you know, move on. Yeah. I'm trying to still think of a Linda listening moment. Well, that, that gave me an idea. This would be, if I were you, this would be mine. It would be... Linda, listen, you have victimized me in the past, but now I am the author of my own story and you have no control over me. <laughs> I, if I were going to say that, I would say it to my dad because my dad. <laughs> Let's hear it. Still, like, he's very like we have a strained relationship. My dad really has a hard time with me because I don't listen to him. Like, okay. I don't follow his direction. Like I don't look up to him as my priesthood leader and he's, it's put a lot of conflict between us. And I think the biggest thing with, with that is just like, I don't have to have your priesthood authority to guide me. Like I have my own intuition. Like I, I don't need anyone else to show me the way. Linda, listen, I don't need your priesthood authority. I have my own intuition to guide me and I don't have to let that victim role define me as a person. Amen. Amen. That was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your story and being vulnerable. And I'm sure that the things that you have said today will help someone else, will resonate with someone else. And I just cannot thank you enough for joining me. It's been my pleasure. Yay. All right. So for anyone listening, um, like and subscribe, do all the things, um, leave a review if you feel so called. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well. Thanks for listening. You can also find me on social media at Colts to Consciousness or reach out by email at Colts to Consciousness at gmail.com.